Whoa. You must have just been off it. Remember how buggy all of this used to be? <laughs> Those are the days. one of our game is now an alpha, which is exciting. And woo! And um, Nathan Bagel Stapley is here in town for two weeks. There he is, Mr. Nathan Bagel Stapley. He recognize you by your hats. Thank you very much. Yeah, no one can still pull off trucker hats except for you. So that's awesome. And um, wait, why are you here, Bagel? To paint? Oh uh, yeah, talk about beta. Beta. Polishing and betaing. Yeah. Awesome. And we, yeah, we finished our last one week sprint, which is a finish up act one as far as alpha goes. And then we are starting on some final polish for some things in beta. But it's looking good. Like, big, dramatic, like... Dave, were you saying to me earlier that you think, mm -hmm. you think we needed a separate um, scene for that little shot there? This background, yeah. yeah. That's a separate... And I have a spot in my for you to put Holy that. Holy shit. So here's her. There'd be, like, a shadow coming over her, and she's starting to get scared. Now, like, I think what would be really cool is, like, for that sort of sequence to kind of be quiet, and then when we cut to her, she gets excited, and the crowd is like, Wah! Like, it's Mark yeah. Chathra! So, like, and we cut to, like, the threshing ocean, and, like, the dripping, and the effects are all totally going crazy here. Blue whale falls off of The crowd is just, like, totally... <laughs> there's gonna be... A, the laser eye goes... And, like, shines on her, and that'll be a pulsating laser shot. And she starts kind of, like, going... Ooh, like, I like the way it's dancing off my skin, the color. You know, like, she starts getting really excited about it, like... And then we do the shot where the tentacle comes in. <laughs> and there's a little long, I'll cut that down, and then smash. What do you think if I did look, here he is, on, like, yeah. without the without her even being on screen, could be cool. We could even start with her and then cut yeah. to that during yeah. the line. Mm -hmm. And here it could be like, look, he's so majestic, even more than we were yeah, told. Yeah, that's could perfect. Could both happen over there. Awesome. And this, this scene where nothing is happening. Really this is the one where the laser <laughs> is shooting at her. So actually, this one would be cool. If the laser's on her, but it could but be that be could cool be when these two other does. maidens are saying this. Like she's well, she's already said, see, he's drawn to flame like a giant moth, and you could have this moment of suspense before he eats her, where they're saying, off screen, yes. kind of quieter. Wait, no way, please, no, he's gonna get me. Yeah. And the team is kind of working on finalizing the first half to get that to go out, and so I'm kind of in this mode of um, a little, it's panic, but it's in a good way because you see the clear delineation of how much more time you have. And that's all you get to work on, and it'll be taken out of your hands when it's done. So you really have to prioritize. When you look at everything, because you could, you could mess with everything in the game and just dink around with it and polish it and do all this stuff. But if you can only do, like, out of the 50 things you could think of doing, you only can do 10 of them, then you're like, okay, i got to pick the 10 most important things to do. And that's nice in the way that it gets you to really focus on what's important about the game. So I'm in that mode of, like, thinking, if I can only do 10 more things to make the game great, what can I do? I think we're going to repaint those maidens' faces anyways, but, you know, at this point, if, if Egg and I were to list all the things we want to repaint, it'd be the entire game, every character, and we obviously can't do that. So I just, if, if, like, there's one that's featured prominently, like that candle maiden, then we should for sure hit it. But if we're not going to cut in close to the resume, then I don't, probably don't want to touch it. At least it'll be lower in priority. Cool. Exciting. Yeah, it's cool. I think it's really going to help get yeah. the thing in there and get all those little bits polished. Yeah. yeah. Should really, it's hopefully, cool. give Mog Chapter some actual weight. Thanks, Thanks guys. Sweet. Yeah. So I guess we should have for sure. Yeah. You really see easy. Like the yeah, now we're going like polish, like tons of draw overs and tons of notes and tons of things just to change and yeah, mm. like all the arts in there. Mm. And now we just have to like push it and pull it to make it more awesome. And is it weird having right. him in the middle? It was bad for the gameplay to kind of like have him in the middle of the scene. 
He's well, off to the side. What do you mean? He's on the no, I mean, like, he wants him to be I don't know. It, it is just because of this. I mean, it's like I'm looking over here uh -huh. all the time. I mean, I know we could put some foreground shit in there, but it'd still be like, Meh. Sure. Like, if he was just taking up the whole screen, that would be That cool. would look so good. I'm just going to be staring at, like, no depth or fidelity. Yeah. I kind of like that. I don't know. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. I think there's a thing with uh, just consistency. Um, making it look like it's cohesive uh, piece, you know? There's a lot of things that you can tell who painted what. And I don't know if I'm bothered by that or if anybody cares about that, but uh, yeah, that's one thing that I want to would like to see. Also, that egg is fucking huge over there. Does it? You don't like a variation of egg size? I, mean, I do like it. Yeah, I like variation. variation. I like variation. No, no, no. Does right, it, but right. does it jump out? <laughs> no, maybe not. Maybe not. Right. There's a there's a small bird with an extremely large egg laying area. <laughs> a huge butt. Oh. Say it, Cloaca. Cloaca. <laughs> I'm trying to get Tim to say it first. Massive cloaca was the original name of Brad's game. Cloaca? Wow. Is that what eggs come out of birds? It's the, uh, it's the unihole. It's the unihole. It's there for procreation and, and uh, defecation. Oh yeah. my god, that's crazy. Yeah, I don't think I've ever worked with an artist who wouldn't spend infinite time polishing the smallest detail if everything else being equal. You know, So there's like just artist tendencies to want to do that. And, and you have to do a certain amount of it for the game to be meaningful and be beautiful. Um, but then you also have to keep in mind all the other things that we have to do, you know, playability and just what the overall experience is like. And that can be difficult to keep your eye on towards the end of a project because you're heads down trying to go through all your list of stuff. But you have to kind of look around you too to make sure you're not just polishing a corner that no one cares about. Mm -hmm. If you had to pick one scene that just visually you think overall works the best and maybe one that works the least, just want to get a... Shell Mountain's my favorite and I think uh, Mariloff Maine is my least favorite. Yeah, I think the my least favorite is the is the Cloud Colony main as well. I would agree with you guys. Definitely. It's a, kind of a tricky scene to kind of balance, but that's what we're going to try and do without changing it too much just because there's a lot of stuff yeah, hooked up. It's definitely for spotty it. right now. Spotty as shit. Yeah. There's four exits and three focal points. It's kind of an overloaded scene from that standpoint. Yeah. yeah. And that big hole is super distracting. Yeah. It's also weird how solid the cloud looks right there because yeah. the yeah. horseshoe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what we're going to try and solve. Yeah, this is like the original one. And you see this big thing right here, which I don't know what that is. I don't know why I put it in there. Um, I have this thing that's like kissing the edge of this frame, which is also weird. It takes your eye over and you don't want anybody to be looking at the very corner of the page. All this contrast is basically just showing off the shape, <laughs> which is like not really that important. Like the important thing is really kind of right here. Mm -hmm. So we're like experimenting with it. I don't know if this is totally there yet. It seems a little dark down here. Mm -hmm. But um, just playing around more with like an, a better composition to kind of like, so your eye goes to places that we want it to go. It's just like anything. You can have like a painting and it's all about focal points and where you're drawing the eye. So you can have a beautiful corner, but if that's not, the painting's not about that corner, then it's actually more of a distraction even though it's executed really nicely. And games are the same way, right? There's all these different elements and you don't really ever see it fully put together and understand how it all flows until the end, because then that's the only time you have all the information, or at least more of it, about where the emphasis should be put. But we planned out things. I mean, we've already polished a lot of the spaceship, and we're starting to polish Vela's world a lot. So um, I actually feel really good in that we've already done a lot of polish on the game. There's not like you play the game that doesn't seem like a wreck, and oh my god, how are we going to pull this thing together? I mean, I definitely see the art getting more and more polished. It's just hard to look at it and see if the game is fun and making sure that that fun is getting more and more fun. That can only be found out by playtesting. So Tim and I and a couple of people have been doing a lot of playtesting um, with people now finally um, actually sitting down and playing the whole game, which has been super exciting and super informative. We're getting a lot of new bugs and tasks and things out of that. Um, but it's just nice to see like people being able to like sit down and actually just play the game as if it was a final game, you know. You can actually like start from the beginning and you have that actual whole like start sequence. You can switch between the characters and you can play all the way through their stories up to the part that we're shipping in January. Yay, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> you did it, Dolan, or do we stop? I've never watched any of our adventure games be played in that level of detail, like sat behind someone and watched them play. In the old days, we would have one pizza orgy, which was like a big play test session with all our friends and relatives where they all talk in one big group, kind of like that Hoff that we did. Mm -hmm. um, but these were actually just watching someone and watching what they do with the cursor. Like, 
oh, they put the cursor over the right spot, but they didn't click. Why didn't they do that? And, and they, or they'll, the object you want them to touch is here, and they'll go all around the room this way. And you're like, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? That's so crazy. And um, just noticing when they're tapping their fingers and when they're you know, laughing and all that stuff is, is really fascinating. Yeah, we've kind of had a little cadence to it. So it just started with uh, people internal who are really kind of into to adventure games specifically, um, just because they'll be a little more keen to kind of understand what's the goal and what they're trying to do. Um, I like that the ship design is like very interlocking. Um, like I, 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 don't, I still don't go the like most optimal way every time because I don't always remember where everything goes, but I feel like I'm starting to actually understand the space and how it's spatially connected, which is a really good feeling to have in a game. So but what I, are you trying to get accomplished? Uh, I mean, I, the getting out of range of the mom arm when I'm trying to get to the boom arm and then uh, get the weaver to go to the correct uh, location. What is that for, though? Um, save guys. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't remember offhand. And then we kind of started opening it up internally to more people who uh, don't typically play this kind of a game. Maybe should hide yeah, around the side, yeah, or? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I don't see any, like, connection back so here. there's, yeah. But, but there's a path up there. Please place your... Hi, I don't know, maybe not. I don't know where else to go. There. Uh, but now we, uh, after that, we kind of had to start moving to people external. Which has been fun too, um, just because even people who are internal that aren't on the team, like you know, they see stuff on people's monitors or they hear things around the office that could like sway um, the data that we're getting from them a little bit. So it's good to get people who are just outside, know nothing about the game, uh, to come in and check it out. Gaijin Games is right across the street, and um, Mike Roush came over with one of his coworkers and tested the game. It's pretty in immersive. It freaks me out. What's that? It's so immersive. Like I, I just, I was just found myself just zoning out in in the world. That's acceptable. Yeah. Uh, there's another layer of baggage, of course, when you bring in another developer because you want them to like your game because you know, and think that it's better than their game. That's the main goal. You want them to go away going, God, this game is so much better than our game. But, well, I told you my tip. One of the tips I learned is whenever you feel like saying the word jealous, just say inspired, and you'll sound like a much more positive, healthy person. So I'm always really inspired when I look at other developers' games. I've never done that much playtesting before. Um, just, just watching someone play an adventure game um, is really like taxing on your concentration to not just be like, uh, you know, like there's a lot of there's a lot of downtime. Um, mentally for the player when they're just kind of like going from one hot spot to another. Yeah, I did um, an internship at EA mm -hmm. and that was very different because um, I was working on like this uh, racing game on the Wii and they would do a lot of the testing kind of either off site or out of sight from me. I would just like see a report from somebody that they had written up after they had you know, I imagine gotten like a bunch of teenagers off the street and paid with pizza to play the game for like a couple hours and they videotape them and uh, um, that was, it doesn't really obviously doesn't compare to like actually sitting on a couch behind someone and like watching them play the game. Um, it's a pretty amazing um, experience actually to like watch someone play a section of the game that you, um, that you scripted up. It's really exciting and frightening and uh, you learn a lot, um, so yeah, it's it's been a pretty positive process, I think. Um, the game's definitely been better for it. Mm -hmm. It's put a lot of questions into my mind, which I think is really awesome, because uh, it's like I kind of wasn't trusting Mom a, a little bit, and now Merrick, now I don't know if I trust him, so now I kind of feel like I don't know. It's like I'm playing as an innocent little kid, and I don't know what's going on. And you know, in, in the first hour, I feel very connected to him. Uh, so that's, I think that's really 
huge because I want to be connected to my character in a video game. The uh, part with the, the train and the avalanche, I, I, I did kind of feel that was like the hardest for me. Um, I was kind of starting to lose a little bit of interest, whereas this, I'm just like, I want to fucking go to the next place and see what see what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's the toughest. That's the toughest one because I um, in my head I was like, okay, there'll be this uh, routine for the boy, and he'll be stuck in it, and the puzzle is to get him out. So that means well, if you're stuck in it, it's getting repetitive, and, you, and if you want to get out, that means it has to be kind of frustrating. And so when people say like, I found that routine really frustrating until I broke out of it. Is that bad feedback or good feedback? Because it's almost exactly the way I described I wanted it to feel, but when someone actually says it to your face, like, oh, it's really frustrating that part. It's like you don't want someone to feel frustrated with your game, but that is what you were going for. No, I, I do think it was pretty good. It was one of the better. I think the thing we still need to talk about, though, is like uh, what happens if they wouldn't have gotten out there, if we have any we could plan do, for yeah, long-term long like stuff. Like now we could add a fail-safe for like pick whatever we think is too many missions to go Yeah, on. like I wouldn't have wanted to go much further than where they were. As long as, so as long as it was a good kind of frustration where they knew there was a way out and they just had to figure it out and then they did figure it out and then they felt smart and then that's good. We did all this play testing and we took out a bunch of places where everyone was getting stuck. And then I was worried that we were making it too easy. So we went back in and took out some of the hints that we put in. And we could test it again to make sure we didn't make it too hard again. So it's kind of a back and forth thing. But it had me thinking about Act 2. That Act 2 definitely has to be harder uh, than Act 1. That only makes sense, right? Your player's more advanced now. They're used to like these kind of puzzles. We had to kind of step up the complexity of all the puzzles. And I was thinking it was too simple. So I'm. Looking at the chart again. Nice chart, huh? Two colors? Just that? That's act two. That's act two, in a nutshell. And that final picture at the bottom looks like two testicles. That's actually the climactic scene of the game. <laughs> then I sketched out the first shot of the game, that's the last shot of the game. I just want to make all my changes to the second half that I'm going to make now, because to make them really work, some of them might have to be pre like set up in the first act. So they don't just appear out of nowhere in the second act. Yeah. Things are going good. I mean, this January thing is real. When we first split the game, I was like, we'll just say we're splitting the game to uh, <laughs> to make Justin happy, you know, and but we'll really we'll find a way to just not have to split the game later. But as the more the closer we got, they're like, well, I think we really have to do it. So yeah. We're definitely splitting it. Let's do this. Moving on, uh, I'm going to give you guys kind of a broad view of the game. We're going to kind of skip around to scenes and stuff. Alright, this is the hillside. This the just looks amazing. I, I love this right here. Yeah. I can be here for an hour. Yeah, it just looks amazing. And I actually dig the music. To me, it has a Zelda vibe to it. I don't know. That's a good thing, I assume. Yeah, yeah, to me, it's a great thing. Yeah. No, I know you're not I'm glad it passes your I mean, to <laughs> No, it's, it's fantastic. Everything sounds great. I, I did hear, like, discrepancies in terms of volume, so obviously really? we have mixing yeah. issues yeah. where, like, the wolf was way much louder than Shay. I just think all the dialogue in the game is too loud. I'm not worried about the loudness as much as the relative volume of the dialogue with other dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. relative, yeah, there were a couple So it's like, yeah, so... I only so, noticed, like, a few lines, not, like... Overall, yeah, kind of that's that's probably just a, a general task once everything is done, you know, that we spend, I would say, a few weeks even to get basically, you know, nuance each one of those lines. Because, again, that's the star of our game is the dialogue. But the dialogue's everywhere. Stop stepping over everything. So, mm -hmm. like, you can have great sound design, but it seems like half of it's getting cut out just because of the ducking and the dialogue. The ducking's very so, aggressive. Mm, ducking's sure. aggressive. There's dialogue over everything. And so the sound design and everything else has to kind of sit with mm. it. So I think that's 
it's kind like, of like a compromise you make in an adventure game, though, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, yeah. so with that like slider, because it's so heavily dialogue, like the dialogue has to be perfect over, say, having yeah. like the best. Yeah, it's going to be. It's, yeah. it's definitely going to be challenge. And, and this is one of those things I think we can sell to the production team e easier. Yeah. But from the looks of the way the game is gone, it's just it's it feels like it's just demanding this triple A attention, you know. Mm -hmm. Dude. Which is really challenging because yeah. we just don't have a triple A budget. Um, I'm definitely going to be asking for some help from you guys. Like the reverb template stuff would be huge. Yeah. The Foley thing would be enormous. Yeah. Oh, man. Get some good. lunch. Good job, Thanks, man. man. Mm -hmm. This helps a lot. All I've right. been like going out of my mind trying to get this thing. And then we just all jump into a freeze frame right for the end. Go team! So we are tracking Foley. Like I, th I think I still think it's very important that even though you're very very limited in your budget, it's important to take time out. We can't do everything. We can't we can't do Foley for everything. But on some of these uh, kinds of things that the player hears a lot, which are footsteps, we try to be very specific and custom. And and I think that's important. So even if you're super on a shoestring budget, you can see we can do things in some office. Not the best acoustic treatment or whatnot, but we try to track those things organically, and I think that has a lot of value. So, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that's been the cool thing about working on this game is because like it just covers a lot of ground. There's a lot of stuff going on, and Pete and I have been having discussions about that because um, uh, he called me up and he was like, you know, I I played through the game. I'm like seeing what Tim's trying to say and all the coming of age stuff, and he's like. I don't know what cereal he was eating, but this is like insanely good. And like, he's like, I, I'm gonna have to go all over the board with music. So here's so it's just input set. everything okay, we're that. doing in the two that. sessions. Every session needs to have These, it, it, it looks like a mess, but it's actually, um, here's the cues prioritized. Here's the um, so this one doesn't show up on the session. amount of time that the no actual the sex that has to record. Mm -hmm. And then that's yeah, translated into how much session time you can afford mm -hmm. for each for each cue, mm -hmm. and um, and so hence this. Mm -hmm. So it's just very simply just you know, playing a couple playing a couple notes. We just need to get them. Yep. We just need to get it all to happen. Well, yep. 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 We put down all the uh, small ensemble music for uh, for Broken Age on track on tape. I always, I still say tape. I still say records too. This story is so wonderful because it's so complex. It's you know, it's not just oh yeah, the young people know everything and the and the and the old people screwed up the world. You know, well, it's not it's not quite like that, is it? You know, the young people don't know everything. They, they, maybe maybe the maybe the the grown ups um, have been through some things. You know, and 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 yet they're make they've made terrible mistakes. And uh, I think that uh, that is really fun to. Um, engage musically. Yeah. I don't know much about part two. <laughs> I've been told things, you know. I've been told that, you know, that there's a. I've been told a rundown of it, but I, honestly, what I've been told, I don't entirely understand right now. And uh, and uh, you know, I think that's. I think that's really good because <laughs> the score is going to discover what part two is when the part two happens. <laughs> It's a it's a real score for a real for a real story. I think it's 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 kind of a labor of love for everybody. I think it's really really what it gets down to. It's, it's you know people get excited about about uh, working on a project and um, you know in in this day and age the people who you happen to run across who get excited about working with you and you're able to to put something together with them might be on, on another continent.
Yeah, so this was this was pretty exciting. Um, I guess the interesting thing about uh, the MSO being involved or um, is the fact that I'm actually a, a Kickstarter backer of the game, and I was well before I'd ever spoken to Peter. Um, and well before this project came on our radar. Really, uh, all of Tim's games and certainly um, Peter's scores are pretty much all of my favourite games from my childhood. Um, they're games I spent huge numbers of hours with my friends um, playing as little kids. Um, so much so that things like Day of the Tentacle and um, certainly later on, uh, things like The Dig and um, Grim Fandango and all of those old uh, LucasArts games, uh, we used to act, uh, when, when little kids playing around um, playgrounds, we used to sort of almost act out the puzzles. So for me, those LucasArts games are a real nostalgia trip um, and they just really remind me of those, those days when we were younger. And then I was watching one of the backer videos um, and saw that Peter was mentioned. It actually wasn't far before any of the episodes about um, Peter really been involved, but I thought, oh wow, uh, Peter's in this, which makes total sense because him and Tim have worked together for a very long time and hadn't really thought about it. And I sort of thought, you know what, I wonder if there's an orchestra recording this. I, I had no idea whether they were having a proper orchestra do it. Obviously I had access to an orchestra. So good morning everyone, thanks for being here. Um, this is for a video game. Um, we're, we're working with Peter McConnell, the composer, who's in LA, and he's on the line now, and we'll be talking with him as we go. Um, upstairs, we've got, hey, Chris and Nick, and um, we've got a fair bit to do, so that's enough talking for now. We're gonna start with uh, SM03, Shell Mound Battle. I really admire any game that, that puts music um, you know, as a really important element of the game. There are so many games, even really big budget ones, and um, some of the biggest budget ones, where you can just tell that they haven't used real musicians. Um, yes, they're very high quality samples and, and so on, and perhaps there are people who don't notice the difference, um, but I always do. And I think the really great part about this is that um, I'm, I'm actually very proud that we're able to bring that that full or orchestra palette 
and that authentic sound to to a project like this. Um, and I think Peter was very um, very pleased as well because um, talking to him, it was always a dream of his to be able to use um, a proper orchestra for this, and uh, but didn't think it was going to happen. And uh, now it has, and I think it's important to me as a backer as well to have that that level of quality on there. So it's great. Should be good. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Violins. Thanks, 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 Brass, Woodwinds. Thank you. Fantastic. I can't believe we got that done. <laughs> no, let's get a beer. I'm, this is the Shell Mound Battle. It reminds me of Goonies. I think it's like that. It's like Jaws, but by Elfman. play when we get the game of the year. <laughs> <laughs> that one's so good. It's amazing. Alright. The only other one we have is... I wish all the animation was done before you guys... <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what's happening with this one. This is for the final scene, which I think Elliot's working on right now. Basically, uh, the symphonic recording, live instruments, and pro voice is all like happening at the same time, uh, which is creating quite an amazing bottleneck. But it's also kind of... Um, communicating with Tim and with production and with the animators because a lot of that stuff uh, is still being worked on visually. I've been doing um, all the play blasts for all of the spaceship um, cutscenes so that we can have a meeting with animators and you and go over what, uh, what we might want to change before we move into final uh, animation on those. My name is Marek and what I'm about to show you is no game. Who well, cares? <laughs> like losing all of his hair. Does it even matter? There will always be war. We did not start it. <laughs> so dramatic. <laughs> what we can do is protect the weak and rescue the helpless. I think his animation on the wolf is hilarious and it's great, but it's a little out of character for Merrick. Like, Merrick is so somber and serious, but when he's, like, putting his arm around him and, like, it seems really jovial and stuff like that. And Merrick is, like, this is... I always thought it was more just, like, super intense, brooding, like, intimidating kind of guy like that. Like, he's a little too chummy, in especially the beginning of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, One I, just I, tear runs down Dave's so cheek. I, I mean, part of it is that he's supposed to be selling the boy on this mm -hmm. whole deal. That's why I was trying but to... But he's not him. selling him like, um, like, hey, buddy, he's not like Bruce Campbell. Like, he's not like, I don't know, Bruce Campbell. But, like, he's not like, um, uh, he doesn't have that kind of well. charlatan-sounding uh, salesman-y tone to his voice. And it's not, it's like his character. He's more just like... Can I say it again? He's like, he's like are you good enough for this mission? Kind of like... He's got a coldness to him that I, I think... I would just hate to lose all that, like, stuff. Because it's just, I don't know, I'm happy. But it's a little too there. goofy. I would say overall the whole thing is a little too goofy. So I feel like it all, it needs a sombering pass on the whole thing, you know, for sure. Just to make his character correct. I could cut out the, like, arm over the shoulder part. Does it even and I think we should cut all this stuff there out. There will always be war. We did not start it. And we cannot stop it. As much as I don't want to do that, because it's amazing. But we I think it's all great, but we, let's get one thing clear. I think it all totally needs to be changed. Yeah. I do think it's a totally wrong take on his character. That's, That's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, we, so I don't want to just kind of like do a couple tweaks here and there. I think yeah. we just uh, understand that he's supposed to be cold and calculating and a little scary. And these make him seem really friendly, like now you've met your new best friend, which he's kind of like not there yet. Like he's not. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Okay. 
Were you here that day that I had to tell Dave to reanimate that scene? Mm -hmm. That was exciting. Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> That's like one of the worst or hardest parts about doing like creative collaboration with anyone is that someone will, you have these great artists and creative people from different disciplines and they'll do something that's just amazing and everybody loves it and um, by itself it's a great work of art like that piece of animation or a piece of music or something but then you go like but that doesn't fit into this larger thing that's that is wrong for the thing that I'm trying to do with this bigger thing so take that all that work you did and throw it away like that's just that's, that's the worst part about it, but um, you kind of have to do that or else you have everything going in all different directions. Okay. So sorry, it's all, it all was really well, cool. I'm yeah. just here to take out things people it'll, like. It'll, like, we'll have it, like I have a movie file of yeah. it, so like 10 years from now I can be like, look how wrong Tim was. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys fix this yet? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're good. Know, we know it needs to be. It's back in the okay. So you can see this is a long cutscene, 4,000 frames long. Just redo all of it. <laughs> Basically, I just, you know, cut out a ton of stuff, put the wolf standing there, and then I send it over to Super Genius, and then they add all the like minor flurries. So it's, it's, it was it like, luckily that character and the acting that we were looking for is easy to sort of refurbish, which is also great because, like we were talking about, I have those big other scenes that it's just like I need to get onto those things. So we're supposed to be locked down on our timing on all of our cut scenes which means Lydia can take it to do visual effects and uh, Camden can take it and do sound effects. Um, and so timing lock is supposed to be done by then, Ex except for these, uh, the, the, the scenes that we don't have the dialogue for. So um, I think Tim is gonna go down this week and record some more dialogue. So, but you know, I mean, we have plenty of other work uh, uh, that, that, that has dialogue, so. So I wouldn't say that's, that's, we're waiting for it, you know. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a good excuse to have. <laughs> you know, it's the dialogue. We, we, we use that excuse to, for a long time with Tim. <laughs> He's like, now you have your dialogue. <laughs> so I'm going down next weekend to record Shay. And this weekend. Guys, this weekend. Next this, right? You guys are coming down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be a party in the studio uh, and record Shay. Um, but we're very excited to announce Elijah Wood is in the game. I can now say that out loud because we've got the rights to announce Elijah Wood is in the game. <laughs> it's not announced yet. Yay. Yeah, it's totally not announced yet, so don't tell anyone. <laughs> so, look at that. Elijah Wood follows me. Nice. Sweet. Anyway, um, actually the very first data point in this whole thing. Data point is the thing we use around the office and around us. We want to sound smart. So the very first thing that happened was years ago, I read in Entertainment Weekly a little interview with Elijah Wood, and he said his favorite video game of all time was Monkey Island. And I was like, that's great, because no one ever mentions, you know, he was talking about it like it was a work of art in a way that people don't usually talk about video games, especially back then, um, in the public as being works of art. And I was like, that's so nice. He must be a, a adventure game player. And it turns out it was true. He was an adventure game player, and he tweeted about Broken Age. He had seen, he had gotten wind of the Kickstarter and gotten wind of the whole project, and he um, he tweeted about how great it looked. And I thought that is awesome. Or were you thinking for the boy? Were you thinking of like asking Elijah Wood for that? Ah, uh, that'd be crazy. We did that. Um. Well, you could listen to his, his voice and see what you thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you guys have any kind of relationship uh, at all. Just on Twitter. Um, I, I mean, I would, I would love it, but I, I need to, I don't know, I don't want to get my hopes up in case he can't do it, but also I want to make sure that that voice would be the exact right for the, for the boy. I bet he could do it. It's a pro. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, God, what would that be crazy if he would actually be in the game. That would be crazy. But I don't want to, like... You know, I'm having fun with him just being uh, interested in the game. That's fun enough, but like, oh, I don't want to ruin it by asking. But I was like, this, I, you, would you, this is crazy, but would you, um, would you ever want to do a voice for the game? Like a little cameo or maybe all the lines for the main character? I just got a direct message from Elijah. What? Just a minute. As we were sitting here? Yeah, it says, Tim. Hello. It says, Tim, I sent, you an email, I sent an email to Izzy at WME to inquire about the game and told her that I'm a huge fan and I want to be a part of it. Yay! So that's Bull good. Ass. For real? <laughs> that's what he said. That's the truth. You want to see it? 
that's effing awesome. I'm freaking out. That rules. <laughs> he is like super sweet and adorable. Like people, uh, yeah. Apparently he's the best. He's worked with him, loves him. That would be great. I hope it works out. He watched the documentary and is talking about the poop thing. A, why is that going to be my legacy? It's horrible. This is wait until you hear the hilarity here. Rice Krispie here. treats. Rice Krispie treats, dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <man. laughs> I asked for that. I was like, could you please? Do you want to like? Do you want it to be more conspicuous, yeah. like underneath the sweater, or are we just like fuck it? Yeah. We are just like fuck it. Yeah, it's probably okay. yeah. We're just like it's the game. Oh, Shay. It is not time to deploy the rescue system yet. Is that Merrick? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. <laughs> Any luck with the ship's controls? And there's a scratch dialogue. <laughs> the manual boom arm Dad, this is great. So, you can tell he plays adventure games all the time. What are you? He does. A lot of experience. You don't want to get any spoilers, though. I don't play it too much. You'll, uh... <laughs> wow, this is awesome. Much. Amazing. Okay. Cool. And he was totally into it. It was really great, because he obviously played a lot of adventure games. And from the very beginning, we're like, this is a page where you're going to say a lot of kind of nonsensical things. And, and he was like, oh, you mean like this is where you use every single ob item in your inventory on a so character, and you get a bunch of dumb responses, and not dumb responses, but... He knew exactly what adventure games were like to play, so he knew how to read the lines, and it was one of those great experiences where he got every joke and he made them all funnier. Do you know how to repair hexapals? Mm. That sounds like a no. That sounds like a no. That sounds like a no. That sounds like a no? <laughs> that sounds like a no. I'm sorry, are these Rice Krispie Treats gluten-free? <laughs> Don't ask him that! <laughs> I don't know, actually. Uh, we're thinking they are because they're rice. I think they are. It's very thoughtful of you. You're welcome. God, is there anything he won't do for you, Chris? I, I love him. When I make food. He spends a little bit too much time doting on Chris. That's my only problem with him. That's he loves Chris too much. Whatever, so jealous. I know, I told you, but then I got the rice crispy treat, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I can't watching eat them on camera, though, because they think I'm on a juice diet. What? Eat it behind this napkin. <laughs> Here's what happens when you're on the juice diet. Hmm? <laughs> my name is Shay, and this is my life on the incubator vessel Bassa Nostra. It's he added something to Shay that I was worried we wouldn't have, because Shay has this kind of character where he's irritated by his, his this computer for being overprotective, and so he's kind of like acting really over it and uh, wants to go on a really big adventure of his own that's real. But that could, if it's done wrong, come off as a really kind of whiny, irritating character. Like, he's like, nah, like he's so over it, like a jaded character. I thought that'd be irritating. But the way Elijah read the character, he's very empathetic. Like, he's like, he seems really warm and just like he is just frustrated and kind of pushing against the restraints of his world. So I think he just added a depth to that character that wasn't there or wouldn't have been there if we hadn't had an actor of that caliber doing the role. So it's time for a mutiny. Time to put aside childish things. Time to grab the wheel of this ship and steer it straight into the storm. Uh, Reds, we are announcing at, um, so voice, we're announcing Elijah at, at, at VGX Awards this Saturday. And then um, we will be having all our, the, all our VO will be final for act one. But we are working now on the finalization plan for everything that's gonna happen to make the uh, shipping of Broken Age in January go flawlessly. <laughs> the flawless execution of Broken Age. Uh, working on a step-by-step -step plan that has not been circulated yet, I don't believe. But it's what you might expect if you're on the Broken Age team. There's a whole bunch of stuff to do. Um, oh, God, a schedule. Ooh. I hate when these sneak up on you. We're right in the middle, or starting this spaceship beta for art. Sugar Bunting Beta for animation, and Game of Programming is already on Space Beta. Yeah, the dates that we're aiming for currently are January 14th, I believe, is the backer ship, which is Levi's birthday. That's how we planned it. Uh, yeah, so then there's also holidays that are in the middle of there, um, which will also prove. And then four days for the Dead Eye God and the Pyramid and the... And the Forest. Yeah, so those are the tricky ones for sure. There's so much animation that needs to be polished still. I mean, really. Well, well, there's a lot that's that's done, but it's just not in. It's somewhat slow going, but. Okay. Does anyone want to say anything about the schedule? Like how easy it looks. <laughs> so let's say we do address the um, 
the feedback that we have on sugar bunning to get to beta, like everything's in it. And then, and then also enough on space boy to, spaceship to get that to beta. Um, or maybe we slip a little bit. I guess what's our plan if, you know, if we do say we get to the end of the sprint and there's clearly some outstanding things on spaceship that we haven't yet reached, how do we prioritize that versus shell mound, which is up next? Yeah. Because if we keep going on, we're going to be cutting into what we're calling bug fix polish time. But really, that's just bug fixing time. Because programmers can't guarantee a stable game if they have like two weeks of bug fix. I mean, that's nothing. Things coming to a head. Coming to a head is one way to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrapping up nicely and elegantly is another. Yeah. Yet a third way is <laughs> crash landing a plane. <laughs> I'm not saying either of those is appropriate. The way that we've been doing stuff, we kind of slip a little bit, and I'm worried that we're just going to keep slipping until the very end. And yeah, and I think that's why it's time. good to have this kind of picture of the rest of development here, to where we know like the 14th and the 28th are the days that we're looking at, so that's the time we have to work with. And I think just trying to prioritize and weight things um, to where we're making the most of that time um, is going to be the challenge. And I guess my interpretation of looking at schedule is, that, that sort of, uh, we need to have a much more um, stricter definition of arbitrary polish to that date or we're never gonna get the game's yeah. bugs under control. And um, you know, I'm sure there are categories that are simple. It's not like we're gonna leave a missing animation or someone locked in a T-pose, right? Like that's clearly a bug. Yeah. But uh, you know, if I really like to have that plant waving in the background or it's not quite as polished as it, or the composition slightly off in this one frame, well, I think the ship has sailed at that point on that stuff, unless they're really, unless it's incredibly low risk and there's nothing else that's higher priority. But yeah, there's a lot to do and two months left. There's just a lot to do and, and everyone's kind of aware of it. Um, so I think people are just really trying to push forward right now. Yeah, it's, um, it's about two months till we're saying pencils down in total bug fixing mode. And, but I would imagine that people will start pulling longer hours and you know, trying to get every last bit of polish into the game as possible. We just realized we have a lot of work still ahead of us. So I'm just, you know, at night I can kind of focus on animation. I don't have to answer questions or run around, which is fine. That's what I'm supposed to do during the day, but um, it doesn't let me get to a lot of the tasks that I have on my on my list. So it's just it's a you know it's a process that um, everything's sort of by hand. You know, still it's a it's a craft that is. Um, you're still sort of hand building things, you know. It's not a, it's not really a production line, and those things take time. So, but that's what makes the job fun. And that's why I like Double Fine because we still do that. You know, we still sort of do things by hand. Um, but you know, it can also make it hard. I feel bad for Ray. Ray's a family man. You shouldn't be staying here late what he is. So I say, no, no, don't do it. Yeah, although I totally rely on him to do that so the schedule actually makes sense. This footage would be better if I made this all into a metaphor, like the way the car turned out to be a perfect metaphor, but, you know, making a game is a little bit like decorating a tree. You take small ornaments from a box and you hang them on the various branches. The branches are a metaphor for um, the backers uh, who hold up the the ornaments or the sound effects <laughs> and the lights uh, are the voice actors. See how that works? Now do you understand game development? It's loud, isn't it? Wake up, everybody! It was exciting, though, wasn't it? Don't you love that smell? 
I'm just worried that a paper wad will get shot off like that guy who got killed in Voyagers. It was a similar thing. Yeah, there was a paper wad stuck in there. 